This morning's scripture reading can be found in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. It's certainly good to see you here this morning. So, so happy that I have the opportunity to present a lesson to you this morning. I really I always enjoy opportunities like this when I get them. There we go. This morning we're going to talk about our trust in God. And I really I appreciate the song that David led just before this. The second verse really sets up what we're going to talk about this morning. It says, At times I feel my faith begin to waver. When up ahead I see a chasm wide. It's then I turn and look up to my Savior. I am strong when he is by my side. And this morning I want to begin with a question. Have you ever felt overwhelmed? Like you just didn't know what to do? Because I certainly have. Whenever I saw this problem pop up on my organic chemistry test on Friday, I felt extremely overwhelmed in that moment. And Charm and maybe a few other people that have taken organic chemistry really know what's going on there because I really don't. But more seriously, we have all felt overwhelmed. We've been in situations where we feel like the world is just crumbling in on us. We feel like we can't go on any longer and everything is going against us. And sometimes we feel like there's just this mountain ahead of us. There's this mountain, we see it, and we can't get over it. We see it, and we say, that is insurmountable. There's no way that I can overcome that right there. And there's a really interesting study done by the University of Virginia about perception. And it's, on, it's actually about a mountain. This is the actual mountain. And if, I were, if we were to stand at the foot of this mountain alone, we would see this. This mountain is 30% larger than the actual mountain. When we stand alone and look at a mountain that we have to climb, it is perceived 30% larger. Now, if I have someone just stand next to me, whether they're going to climb it with me or not, this is what the mountain now looks like. 20% smaller than the original mountain. That is amazing. When we have somebody by our side, to look at this mountain with us, to go along that journey with us, we're so much more positive. And so often in our lives, we feel like we're staring at that mountain. We're staring at a mountain and we say, there's no way we can get over it. Maybe with someone by our side, it looks like that. But the one thing that this study didn't account for was for Christians like us. For people like us that have an omnipotent God on our side. An omnipotent God that is all-powerful, that is always with us. And whenever he is with us, our mountain looks a little bit more like this. It looks like something that we can easily overcome. Something that is well within our power to, to overcome. And I really love Proverbs 3, verse 5 that Robbie read for us. I really think that it sets up our lesson so well. It says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. Trust in God. Don't lean on yourself. When you see that mountain, don't lean on yourself and look at it as 30% bigger. Lean on God and see it as a small hill to, go, to overcome. And so this morning, we're going to talk about that. And we're going to begin by looking at two biblical examples of trust and trust in God and what their reward and what the outcome was, them, was for them. And then afterwards, we're going to look at that and we're going to see how can we apply that to our lives. How can we take that into our lives and make that mountain look a little bit smaller. So the first example that we're going to talk about is Caleb in Numbers, 20, Numbers chapter 13. And so at this point, a little bit of context to Numbers 13. The Israelites have come out of Egypt with Moses. They've been wandering in the wilderness trying to get to the promised land, and they're finally there. They're at the gates of the promised land, this land that God has said, I have given to you, go and take it. And in verse 1 and 2 in, cha in chapter 13, we see that promise. In verse 1 it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall ye send a man, every one, every one a ruler among them. 
So God has promised this land to his people. But he tells Moses, he says, send men in to scout it out, to see what the land is like and how you're going to attack this. This is a land that was promised to his people. And then if we pick up in verse 25 of Numbers chapter 13, it says, this is after the spies have returned from scouting out Canaan, it says. And they returned from searching of the land after 40 days. And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran to Kadesh and brought back words unto them unto all and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. And they told him and said, We came unto the land whither thou sent us and surely it floweth with milk and honey and this is the fruit of it. In these verses, we see these spies come back and they say, this land is amazing. It's milk and honey flowing. We have everything that we would need. But if we continue reading, it takes a drastic change. In verse 28, it says, Nevertheless, the people were strong that dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great. And moreover, we saw the children of Anak there, the Amalekites, dwell in the land of the south and the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains and the Canaanites dwell by the sea and by the coast of Jordan. So then these men take a drastic change to what they're seeing. They say there was this wonderful land that we could live in and that we could prosper in. But there's these giants. There's these men that that are there that we can't beat. We can't overcome them. They're too great for us. They're too strong. And then if we continue reading in in verse 30, we see Caleb. And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. In this verse, we see Caleb come in. And it's so, so different from what those other ten spies came back and said. Caleb says, you know what? This is our land. God has promised it to us. There is nothing that is going to stop us. He is going to deliver this land. Let us go in. Let us overcome this land. It is going to be easy. And we see the mountains that these men are looking at. The 10 spies that came back and said, these men are too great. We can't do it. They're looking at that mountain and they're saying, this is insurmountable. There is no way that we can overcome these people. But Caleb, Caleb had trust in God. He had trust in that promise that God had given them that he said, I will deliver this land to you. And he said, this is easy. He says, we are well able to overcome it. But sadly, there's more to read of these verses. In verse 31, it says, But the men that went up with him said, We be not able to go up against the people. For they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land which they had searched unto the children of Israel, saying, The land through which we have gone to search it is a land that eateth up the inhabitants thereof. And all the people that we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, the son of Anak, which come of the giants. And we, we were in our own sight as grasshoppers. And so we were in their sight. So though Caleb had this wonderful and great and positive, this positive report that came back, sadly the ten other spies convinced the people of Israel not to go in. They scared them too much. They said, this mountain is too much, too much for us to handle. And remember, Caleb was not looking at a different land. Caleb and the ten spies that went in were all looking at the exact same land. They all sell the exact same people, the exact same giants. But the only difference was is that those ten spies looked at it on their own. They said, on, my, on our own, we can't defeat these people. But Caleb said, we have God on our side. He trusted in God and knew that God would deliver them out of this. And then, even though he was unable to, and even though he was unable to convince the people to go into the land then, he eventually received a reward for his trust. In chapter 14, verse 38, it says, But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, which were of the men that, were, that went to search the land, lived still. So Caleb and Joshua were the only spies 
who got to live to conquer that land that God had promised him. Because of Caleb's trust, because of Joshua's trust in God, they were the only two that lived on to see this promised land. Now our second example is the young man with the bread and fish in John 6, verse 1 through 13. And this is not a biblical character that we study often, if any at all. He's a very minute part in this, in this story, but he's, very, he's a very great example of trusting in God. So starting in verse 1 of John 6, it says, After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him, because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up in a ma- into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh, when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him. He saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. So in the setup, of, in the chapter before this, Jesus had gone in and he had healed many diseased people. He had cured people that couldn't see. He had done many miracles. And now people are following him. And so he gets here and these people are hungry. He sees these people and they're hungry. They need food to stay there. And he looks to Philip and he says, how are we going to feed all these people? And this question wasn't for Philip. He knew, Jesus knew exactly how he was going to feed these people. But he wanted to teach Philip a lesson. He wanted to see what Philip was going to say and show him a lesson in trust. And now if we continue to read in verse 7, we see Philip's answer. It says, Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon's brother, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad here which hath five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? So first off, we see Philip, and Philip is bewildered by this question. He says, we can't buy enough food, we can't buy enough bread for these people just to have a little nibble off of it. There's no way that we can do it. And then Andrew comes up and he says, well, I have this, I have this kid, and he has five loaves and two fish. But that's not going to do anything for us, is Andrew's attitude. And so when we look at them, we see Philip who saw this mountain, and he saw this problem that Jesus had posed to him, and he said, that's too big. There is absolutely no way for us to do that. And then Andrew comes in, and Andrew does just slightly better. Andrew sees the problem. Andrew finds a solution, but that's where his trust runs out. That's where Andrew's trust runs out. He doesn't trust that those five loaves and those two fish could feed that many people. And not much is said about this young man. I'm going to make a few assumptions about him. And the most important assumption that we have to make is that he offered this. And I truly believe that he did. I believe that the young man went to Andrew and said, I have this. And assuming that he did that, he believed that even though he had very little, fit, very little food, only five loaves and two fish, he believed that Jesus could use that, that he had the power to turn that in and feed well over 5,000 people. And if we continue reading in verse 10, we see his reward. And in verse 10 it says, And Jesus said, make the, men, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down, and number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples. And the disciples to them that were set down, and likewise of the fish, as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. So these verses show us the, the result of that young man's faith and that young man's trust in God. His five loaves and two fish were able to feed well over 5,000 people. And it wasn't that these 5,000 people just took a few little nibbles. They were full. Every man there, every woman and child there, 
was full. They could eat no more. And then physically he got a reward back because of his trust. He got more bread and more fish afterwards than what he had started with. And so whenever we look at this, this young man, and then we look at the two apostles, the two apostles were supposed to be these great, great men, these faithful men. But yet when they saw this, they ran into that mountain and they said, we can't do it. We can't overcome this. But the young man said, with Jesus, with God's help, we can overcome this. Even with the little that I have, we can overcome this. So now that we've looked at these two examples of, the tr of trust and the reward that they gain and that, and that we can gain from our trust, now what does that mean for us? How can we apply that to our lives? And we can obviously see that we need to trust in God. We need to have that trust that he is going to be able to pull us through. And I want to begin with 1 Peter 5, verse 7. In 1 Peter 5, verse 7, it says, Casting all your cares upon him, for he careth for you. When we trust in God, and we trust in the power that he has and the abilities that he has, we're going to cast our cares on him. We're going to give what is bothering on us, what is tough on us, we're going to give it to him. And we're going to know that he is able to bear it and he is able to bring us through that. And once we do that, we no longer have those cares and those worries. We know that God is going to take care of it. We know that even though that mountain seems so big to us, God will bring us through it. And then another verse that I want to look at is James 4, verse 8. In James 4, verse 8, it says, Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. To me, this verse is extremely related to trusting in God. Whenever we draw nigh to God, whenever we trust in God and put ourselves near Him, He's going to come near to us. And as we mentioned at the very beginning, we have an omnipotent God, a God that is all-powerful, that can do anything. And when we draw nigh to Him, He'll draw nigh to us and be with us. And then our final verse that I want to look at is Romans 8, verse 37. And this verse really shows you the power that God has and that we have when we're with God. And verse 37 says, Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. When God is on our side, when we have our trust in God and he is with us, we are able to overcome anything. We're able to conquer anything. We're able to get through anything because God is by our side. And whenever we realize that power that he has, that is so freeing for us. We're able to see those struggles and we're able to feel overwhelmed. But whenever we feel overwhelmed, then we're able to reflect it back on God and say, God, help me. I'm going to cast these cares on you because I know you can handle it. And I know when you're by my side and whenever we're together, I'm able to accomplish anything. And that is the beauty that we have when we trust in God. And as we wrap up this lesson, I want to read to you my very favorite poem. And the poem is Our Deepest Fear by Mary Ann Williamson. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There is nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is not just in some of us. It is in everyone. And as we let our light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we're liberated from our own fears, our presence automatically liberates others. And to me, this just screams out the theme of this lesson. When we feel overwhelmed, when we feel like nothing is going our way and the world is crashing down on us, our deepest fear, we feel inadequate. We feel like we can't do it. But because we are children of God, because God is on our side, that makes us powerful beyond measure. 
the things that every single one of us can do with God's help is unmeasurable. And then whenever you keep going through it, it also shows us, it shows us what happens when we allow ourselves to overcome our own mountains. Maybe I'm struggling with something, but I finally overcome it, but my brother is struggling with something and he can't overcome it. He feels like everything is going wrong, that there is no way he ever gets past this. But whenever he sees my example or your example, when he sees our example of trusting in God and overcoming those mountains, that gives him the strength. That gives him the ability to know, you know what, I can make this through. I'm going to be okay because I have God on my side. And this morning, I hope that this has been an extremely encouraging lesson to you. I feel, to me, it was extremely encouraging to read. But maybe this morning you're not a child of God yet. Maybe you're not there yet, but you're ready to make that lifetime commitment to join us in these blessings. To be able to have that trust in God, to know whenever things come at you, you're going to be okay and you're going to overcome. Or maybe this morning you're facing your own mountain. And if you are, I hope this lesson gave you the strength to say, you know what? God is on my side. I can overcome this mountain. But sometimes it's good just to have that that hug from a brother or sister, or that encouragement of prayers. Or maybe this morning, you've let that mountain defeat you. You've said, I can't overcome this mountain, and you've given up. Now is a time for you to come back, to come back to God and to finally overcome that mountain that, let, that you lost to, that mountain that you couldn't overcome, because with God you can. If you have any needs of the congregation, please come forward as we stand and sing. Have I now back and